The epistle reading is Romans chapter 13, beginning with the eighth verse. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this sentence, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what hour it is, how it is full time now for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. Let us then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves becomingly, as in the day, not reveling in drunkenness, not debauchery or licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of God for the people of God. We, um, in worship, uh, we read from Scripture, believe that Scripture's got a, a power to make a difference, change things. Uh, get ready to get Bibles to our third graders. They're excited. I'm excited. We, be we believe that matters. It's God's Word. Sacraments, we're going to have baptisms at 11. We believe there's some, there's some power in that. Um, I can testify to this. Uh, some of you don't know, th th this is an amazing thing. Uh, last Sunday, uh, some of you were so kind as to trash talk me about my hometown Gamecocks <laughs> for losing a football game to the Tar Heels. And some of you even went into the future. We're going to beat Duke too. Like, oh gosh. And some are bragging on Drake May, the quarterback for UNC, that he is going to win the Heisman Trophy. And I've got to be honest with you, I am rooting hard for Drake May to win the Heisman Trophy. Do you know why? Drake May is a baptized United Methodist. <laughs> Not only, though, is he a baptized United Methodist, he was baptized by these very hands. <laughs> and I detect my influence. <laughs> That's a great play. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And no one's thanked me, right? They just trash talked me. What's that about? Uh, Bible text. Sometimes there's a Bible passage that it just becomes the tipping point. Like if you read another Bible, then some verse just tips the person over the edge to something amazing. Uh, Romans 1.17 did that for Martin Luther, did it for John Wesley, kind of the verse Methodist. For me, it was uh, Jesus saying to those disciples, follow me. Some people, uh, they want to find that tipping point, and they do this thing where you open the Bible at random, and whatever it lands on, you say, that's what I'm going to do for God. Let me... Let me discourage you from this. Uh, one, you can get crazy things, but then also you could turn out like St. Francis. He went to the priest at the San Nicolo Church in Assisi and said, open the Bible at random, wherever it lands, that's what I'll do. The priest opens the Bible, says, sell all you have and give it to the poor. Francis said, what choice do I have? <laughs> that's why he's Saint Francis. By the way, Augustine, before he was Saint Augustine, he was actually, his life was just a mess, a uh, train wreck. Uh, he did the same thing. He was just in agony trying to figure his life out. He, he's, uh, he was just a mess. And so he's visiting a friend named Olypius, and he's hanging out in his garden one night, and he's, he's just, he's in agony trying to figure out his life. What does he want to do? Is there a God? Does God want something? And he hears a voice in his agony. It sounds like a child in the next yard saying, pick it up and read it. Pick it up and read it. Pick up what? He looks, and there's a Bible. So he goes, okay. So he opens it at random and lands on this passage that Vince just read from Romans 13. It is time to wake from sleep, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. Paul, in a great many, many uh, passages, uh, used this uh, as an image of waking up, waking up. It's as if we're, uh, we're a little drowsy. Uh, we're, we're sleepwalking through life, right? Uh, we fragile want to stay in bed a little longer. We like our dream world uh, that we're in. We're in a bit of a fog. 
I'm doing this How to Be Spiritual series. I hope you're tracking that. And a lot of it really is just spirituality is being awakened to God. Be awakened to God. Wake up to God. Wake up then to your true self that God made. It's, it's so much cooler than the world's manufactured self. There's so much joy. There's so much life. There's so much hope in it. Awaken to God's power in your life. I, I read the other day Tim Keller, kind of conservative evangelical pastor in New York, died recently. Brilliant man. Uh, said so there are all these uh, kind of truisms in American culture that are very different from the gospel, but we don't always notice that. We don't always wake up to that. <laughs> and the things that he names, they seem so self-evident, but, but they're, they're not of the Bible or of God. It's things like you've got to be true to yourself. You're free to live as you choose. Do what makes you happiest. Everyone has a right to decide right and wrong. Turns out... That's not biblical, and it's not really the wisest, most faithful, the healthiest way to live. The truth is, you were made for God. Do what is God's will. There's joy in that. Find a way to, I think how to put it, the word that came to me this week was deferential. It's not that I'm just awakened to God, but then I become deferential to God. And the more that I am deferential to God, then I come to be awakened to the other people, and as I'm awakened to the other people, I become deferential to them. <laughs> I was remembering this week when my son Noah was growing up, I was trying to teach him, like, how to be a good guy, how to be gracious, how to have good manners, and I kept telling him new things, like, hold the door for the other person, don't eat the last biscuit, whatever. And one day he complained, he lashed back at me and said, Dad, there are too many rules, I can't remember all these rules, there are just so many of them. I said, son, there is one rule only, and the one rule is always defer to the other person. That's why you hold the door. That's why you don't eat the last biscuit. That's why you yield your seat to someone else. He's like, hmm. He's got to be pretty good at it <laughs> as a grown-up, for those of you who are struggling with that with your children. It eventually takes hold. <laughs> That's good manners, but it's also profoundly Christian, isn't it? always defer to the other person or as paul puts it put on the lord jesus what do we owe we owe love love so i want to talk about love and to see if this bible text might have power among us especially in this quarreling and jealousy business we americans have become the masters of quarreling and jealousy we lead the world in quarreling and jealousy and I wonder if we can do anything about it. So when I read this text, uh, here's kind of my sermon process. This is months ago. I was looking at it. And uh, I saw it's all about waking, being awake. And I thought of the word woke. And I thought, man, if I talk about being woke, that'd be really hard for people. So I said, I won't talk about woke. But then I heard God saying to me, chicken or something like that. And I thought, I love you guys, you need some help on a few things, so let me try this. Being woke, there's a candidate for president who said that wokeness is a virus more dangerous than any pandemic. And I get how this goes, there are people that are kind of proud that they are woke, and then other people think they're idiots because they are woke, it becomes sort of a term of derision. If you think about what happens in America, and, and with us, is uh, we, we forget to love, right? We, we, so half of America says to the other, have you are so unenlightened. How could you be so ignorant? Then the other side says back, how could you be so unenlightened? How do you, why do you carry everything to some extreme? And we just do this, do this back and forth. Uh, the people who say, how could you be so unlightened? They might even point to Romans 13 and say, Paul says that you should be woke. But is that what Paul meant to be? woke in this way there's so much anger there's so much blame there's so little action based on these things so little love paul says what to do what's owed is love and the way to love you know this in relationships and it certainly is true for us in the body of christ it's not about finding common ground it's finding higher ground jim wallace thought of that it's a great thing right we don't want to find common ground we're looking for a higher ground. So let me tiptoe into a few difficult topics and see if we can find some higher ground. 
Last weekend, I read uh, in the Wall Street Journal, Tina Deskovich, who is one of the heads of Moms for Liberty, said that her child came home with a wanted poster. And what the poster said is, wanted Christopher Columbus for crimes against humanity. This really bugged her. I would add, when my kids were little, they came home with stuff from school that made me absolutely apoplectic. Every one of them at some point brought home, here's our current list of spelling words, and there'd be a misspelled word on the list. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> Noah comes home from Myers Park High School one day, and he said, our teacher today talked about the Emperor Constantine. I thought, wow. I don't think I heard of him in high school. I said, what'd she say about him? Well, that, that Jesus was nobody, and there weren't any gospels, but then Constantine, 300 years later, invented all this stuff and forced it on people. Like, why is he being told this at school? It made me apoplectic that this was going on. So I thought about the Christopher Columbus wanted for crimes against humanity, and it occurred to me this week, you could just as easily say, wanted Moses and Joshua for crimes against humanity. I mean, if you think about it, if Moses and Joshua hadn't brought those people to the promised land and gone in, we wouldn't have all these troubles that we have today in the Middle East. It's got to be their fault, right? You see what we do there? <laughs> like Christopher Columbus, is he a horrible person or is he a person of great achievement? But he had a blind spot, didn't he? He did something that he didn't intend to do, and that was to bring disease from Europe into this new continent. It's always that way. Great people have some shadow side. Great people do something, but then there's a cost. Isn't that the point of the movie Oppenheimer, in a way? And it's this way with you, right? You achieve things. You work. You accomplish things. But then in you, there's something that's broken. There's something that, that's awry. There's something that you hide, maybe even from yourself. That's just human nature. It's just human nature. In the wake of the overturning of Roe versus Wade, and as I say those words, I feel you getting nervous out there, but don't be. Somebody said to me the other day, I said, I want to mention this in my sermon. Somebody said, that's political. You can't talk about that. I can't think of, of anything more profoundly theological than life. God's the creator of life. God's the giver of life. God's pro-life. If you read the Bible, God's all about life. And we as Christians, don't we? We have good cause to be pro-life, not, not, not with the venom and not with the anger and the judgment. But we're for, I don't know anybody. I've never met a person who's for abortion. Have you? I just don't know anybody. Oh, abortion, that's a good idea. Let's do that. <laughs> it's always some tragic circumstance and we're pro-life. I mean, we believe that about the Gospels, that it began with, with uh, God came into Mary's womb, Jesus, small, vulnerable in there. That's how you began life, small, vulnerable in your mother's womb. And my question is, thinking of higher ground, because we can't find common ground, is there some higher ground where we could say that is actually consistent with saying this is something that a, a woman has to decide is between her and God. That's what we do with most things, don't we? And really, as a church, don't we have higher goals than adjudicating those things? And what is our higher goal? When I was thinking about it this week, and our, our higher ground that's going to be hard to get to is instead of arguing over, you know, pro-life or, or pro-choice, and instead of debating that endlessly, maybe, maybe God's asking us to do something uh, better and harder, <laughs> which might be to recognize that we live in such a uh, highly sexualized culture. I remember trying to watch television with my daughters growing up, and I would, I'd blush, we'd try to talk about it, turn off. The, it's just such a highly sexualized culture. Can we as a church be the people who say, that we're not that. <laughs> we are not that. We're going to be the people that understand that intimacy is a precious pleasure, is an amazing, beautiful gift from God. And God gave it to us not to fritter it away here and there, but rather in a... 
Like, can we figure out ways to, to talk about that and make that a thing so the next generation understands how really, truly joyful and wonderful uh, that that could be? Could be. I'm pretty sure of this. Outlawing abortion or insisting on the right to choose, neither of those will change human hearts and behavior. Neither of them will change human hearts and behavior. But that's our thing, changing human hearts and behavior. Uh, violence, that's easier. Nobody likes uh, violence. What we hear is, well, there's no one thing that creates the gun violence in America. <laughs> I kind of hate, that's true. I kind of hate it because if there's no one thing, then it seems like it's too many things, and so we don't do anything at all, right? We just wait for the next news story and say our prayers are with the victims. We do that again. <laughs> it's just so sad and so tragic. It was one piece we could actually do something about, thought about this, is it's hard to watch television without somebody shooting somebody. It's hard to go to a movie without somebody killing somebody. And my question is, what would it be like if all the Christians of America uh, said that, you know, if I'm watching TV and somebody pulls out a gun and shoots it, I'm going to turn my TV off. What if you're in a movie and somebody shoots somebody and you get up and walk out of the theater? If we did this, they wouldn't serve this to us. <laughs> they only serve it to us because we stay and watch it. We have a taste for it and the advertisements are coming. <laughs> what if we did just that? Wouldn't that begin to change things? Let's talk about uh, race. Race. The whole word woke, by the way, is a word in the African American vernacular. How do we find a higher way on race? How do we find a way to love? On the one side, you have people who say, I'm not racist. This is ancient history. Let's move on. They can even point to John Lewis, who was a black congressman from Georgia. John Lewis said, we have made so much progress, right? So you get that whole group. But then on the other side, you have those, and there's just so much shaming of white people. There's so much guilt among white people, white shame, white guilt. I can assure you of this. My African-American friends find white shame and guilt to be utterly exhausting. <laughs> like, they just can't stand it. I wonder if there's not a higher way. And the way that I at least think about the higher way is instead of having this debate, I'm not racist versus, oh, there's so much shame. Uh, I want to focus on something that's going to be a big deal in this uh, How to Be Spiritual series that I'm doing. It's in Psalm 139. The psalmist prays this, O oh Lord, search my heart and see if there's anything in my heart that is awry that is not of you. Maybe with race, I can, we all could humbly ask God to search our hearts and is there any little something in there that maybe I got it growing up in Savannah, Georgia. Who knows where it came from? Is there any little thing in there? Lord, could you heal me from that? We could ask the question, is there racism out in the world? Good grief. That's the easiest question in the world to answer. Of course there is. And isn't the church supposed to play some role in trying to remedy that, make it better, and so on? Maybe the harder question would be not just, Lord, is there anything in me? Is there anything in the world? What about, is there anything in my immediate realm that I've not thought about? Maybe in my business maybe in my family's habits and practices. Lord, search me. Know my heart. See if there's anything that's awry in me. Uh, this Augustine, he became probably our greatest theological teacher in the entire history of the church, and everything that he talked about in his writing is about grace and mercy, grace and mercy. That's really the key to the end of quarreling and jealousy, right, is grace and mercy. I was on a panel the other day. This is great fun. There are five of us on this panel, and there's people from different religions. And uh, somehow I was sitting in the middle of these five, and so a question came to go down the road. <clears throat> and the question was, tell us about your religion's view of redemption. So the first guy says, well, I find that sometimes I mess up, and when I mess up, God forgives me. And the second guy said, I also find that I mess up sometimes, 
And if I tell God that I'm sorry or try to make it right, then God forgives me. <laughs> and then it came to me. And I said, uh, my problem is not that I mess up sometimes. My problem is I'm a mess. I'm a mess. And you're a mess too. You do great things. You know how to get dressed up and come to church. Congratulations. That's a wonderful thing. We're so glad. It's great to be together, isn't it? But yet we're a mess inside. There's something that we buy all those American messages. Just, just do what makes you happiest. And everyone can decide right and wrong instead of awakening to God, instead of deferring to God. When we awaken to God and we defer to God, we learn all about grace and mercy. There's so much grace and mercy in God and it's so life-giving. It's so healthy. It's such a beautiful thing. It's what God made us for. It's why we feel hollow without it. It's why we stay so busy. It's why we're so frantic. It's why we're always hooked on our phone. <laughs> maybe, maybe the hollow place in me can be filled by what's in uh, I don't think so. There it is. It's grace. Mercy. I also said, uh, my only my problem, I'm, I'm a mess. I have another M problem, and that is that I am mortal. I'm mortal. I've had, uh, in our circle, we've had uh, deaths recently of uh, people who are just too young. Although I hesitate to say that, they're always too young, aren't they? Remember Lisa's grandmother died at 96, and some fool in my church said to me, that's not so bad, she made it to 96. I said, well, I'm sorry, we love her. We miss her sorely. She's so important in our lives, we weren't ready to part with her. We're mortal. And all that uh, American uh, sophistry around, you know, just be true to yourself, just live as lives you choose, do what makes you happy. Everybody can decide right and wrong. When that happens, then when you die, you're just dead. And maybe they have a party and they tell stories about you, say, oh, I remember old John, he was a great guy. Oh, Susie, she was terrific. Oh, that's so cool. Over. <laughs> But because of the grace of God, it's never over. God's never done. God never gives up on you, even in death. God's not done with having a relationship with you, even in death. God wants you to continue, even in death, to awaken to God, to defer to God, <laughs> to be God's child, to be God's great creation, the God that made you. Just can't, can't, can't bear to lose you. <laughs> That's grace. It's mercy. Because of the grace and mercy, then what choice do you have but to awaken to God and to defer to God and to awaken to other people and to defer to them, to love them? If God is all mercy and grace, why do we snipe at each other so? Why do we in the privacy of our minds think those other people are just such numbskulls? God says there's, there's higher ground. There's higher ground. You can love. You must love. And what a privilege that is. Thanks be to God.